Dr. Suzanne Spencer Wood is a professor of anthropology and women and gender studies at Oakland University and is a well known and respected authority on historic ceramic styles, the anthropology and historical archaeology of gender, class, and race, as well as the trade and consumer choice in historical archaeology. She's also part of the team that excavated around the parsonage that now stands on the village grounds here. Uh, right over there, <laughs> uh, after the building was relocated, and Dr. Spencerwood has her PhD in anthropology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm sure I missed out on some of her specialties. So. <laughs> You'll remember a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really uh, your bio on the Oakland page helps. Uh, oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, wonderful. Well, nice to see all of you. And I'm going to be combining this talk because the talk was originally I was going to do something on architecture in the village, uh, historic architecture. Uh, and I just didn't have a long enough talk about that. And also, I remembered then um, Professor Stamps, who's sitting in the back there, and I did an conducted an excavation together on the site of the parsonage, which is right next door. And so um, I, I belatedly realized, gee, I really need to talk about that. And so this is sort of a combined talk with architecture and archaeology. And then if there's time, I'm also going to tell you about um, excavations I did in, well, I didn't do the excavations, actually, artifact analysis in uh, Fort Independence in Boston. Um, and the reason that um, actually Alex asked me to do both of these um, excavations is that they really illustrate uh, what, how archaeology, if you record where you find things, can give you um, extraordinary information that you wouldn't get from the, that you don't get from the documents. And so these are, uh, these are both examples of recording where you find things. Um, now this, for the, for the architecture part to start with, um, the town hall uh, front building here, which was the town hall in 1927, is a Dutch colonial revival style, which you may or may not know. But what, what makes it Dutch colonial, and, and this is, indicative of the Dutch people that were coming to Troy from upstate New York. Um, and so they brought this style with them. And the hallmark of the style is that slanted roof right here. Uh, and the fact that there's no overhang on the gable here whatsoever, but there's a big overhang in the front. And then um, it's usually just one story with uh, these smaller windows, shorter windows like this, with shutters. Uh, and in this case, it's got, uh, it's got dormers as well, and uh, it's also got slate shingles, which is a real 19th century thing, so, um, and they last a long time. Then the Caswell House is Greek Revival style, and this is pretty interesting. Greek Revival was used starting in the 1830s in the United States as a, um, in, it, it, because it symbolized democracy. In other words, in school, people were studying Greek and Latin, and in that process, they learned about Greek democracy. Uh, anybody know what the problem is with Greek democracy? Who didn't, ha who didn't participate in that democracy? We, yeah, women, slaves, uh, yeah, it wasn't really a democracy except for, except for the, um, the Greek guys. It was for Greek men, it was a democracy, but not for Greek women and not for slaves. And so uh, it's interesting that our country actually adopted Greek democracy as a symbol. Uh, they also adopted Roman, but we'll, and we'll get to that. Actually, this is a Greek revival house, and it's a, pretty, it's a very early one for this part of the country because it starts as a style in the 1830s in New England, and then it spreads over to Michigan, and so usually it doesn't show up here until the 40s, you know, or later, actually. It goes through the 60s here. Um, so the things that make it a Greek revival are this part here uh, that uh, symbolizes the 
uh, end part of a Greek temple, you know, the pediment of a Greek temple, even though it just has these little indents to symbolize that. And then this is the frieze across the whole big part of the temple here. And uh, then the door is typically Greek revival, although you don't get doors like this on Greek temples, so, you know, it's clearly made up later. Um, but it does have two columns on either side, which are the symbol of the temple. Uh, these are called pilasters because they're not real columns, they're flattened, you know, flattened uh, symbols of, of columns. They're not re the real thing. Um, and then you have this uh, top, which again is like what you get on Greek temples, and the side lights are very typical of Greek revival. Now the funny thing about this uh, building is that it also has a Georgian feature, which is the earlier style before Greek Revival. Georgian is 1850 to, um, to 1900, yeah, 1750 to 1800, sorry. 1750 to 1800, approximately. So, but it's later here. But here you've got these little dentals. These things are called dentals here because they look like little teeth up against the top of the cornice here. And you don't get those in Greek Revival. They're not supposed to be there, <laughs> but they're there. And uh, so what you've got is an interesting folk combination of Greek Revival and Georgian. And Georgian is the earlier style that went along with our idea that we, you know, we're called a republic. The America, America is called a republic. And that name was taken after the Roman Republic. The Greeks didn't call themselves a republic. The Romans did. And so the, the Georgian style was symbolizing our, America being a republic like the Roman Republic. And it has Roman, ar Roman arches uh, is over the doors, generally, is one of the ways you can tell that. And it has these fat dentals, which you see here. Um, and so this is kind of a combination of two sort of democratic uh, references to Rome, which was a republic. Um, but was also just about as much a democracy as Greece was. In fact, it was exactly the same kind of democracy. Women couldn't vote, uh, slaves couldn't vote, you know, just um, the Roman men could vote. So it's interesting to me that these were both adopted as uh, democratic forerunners to this country. And when you realize we had slavery in the South, it makes all the sense in the world. And women couldn't vote here either. So these all legitimated what was actually happening in the country. Um, the Niles Barnard Tavern site, which I took this picture before it got moved. This is where it actually sat on uh, Troy Corners. Um, and so this also has the same kind of doors here you can see for Greek Revival. But notice it doesn't have the return here on the top of the temple, the pediment. It just has a roof, a roof that ends, and that's not unusual. This also does have, it still has the freeze board here. You can see the wide freeze board under the roof. And you still have a cornice that's got a lot of nice little details on it there a wide cornice there on the edge of the roof. But the roof doesn't return back in, and that's not at all unusual with folk Greek revival. In high style Greek revival, it would go all the way across. Um, but uh, what you can tell it's Greek revival is because of the, the slope of the roof, which is relatively wide. So it's a, got a relatively wide angle, and that looks pretty much like a Greek temple. If you look at the, in other words, the top here has a pretty wide, very wide, it's wider than the houses, and it's, you get all the way across here. Uh, so that's why that little return here symbolizes that. Um, and the columns, why you, why you get fluted, you get fluted columns on Greek Revival. You see these are fluted. Um, and whereas on the Georgian you get smooth columns because the Romans use smooth columns, like on the Pantheon and so forth. Uh, and so you can see the difference well, once you get to know about it. Uh, now the store site, the store building here is also Greek Revival, although I understand it was constructed, especially for the store, but it is clearly Greek Revival. See, it's got the same return. This is like the top, this is like the top of a column, and then this is the pilaster going down the side, just this board. Just the board symbolizes a column, right? 
which is kind of interesting. Uh, and so people got like, this, these are folk versions. They're not high style, um, but they're folk versions. And the other thing you get in uh, folk version, well, high style also, is long windows on the first floor. They're, they're like much longer than an average window. And the door is always on one side um, like that. And so this has some elements of high style Greek revival, actually. Um, then the Poppleton School is what's called Italianate style, which was very popular in the 1870s. And Italianate, as you might imagine, this was actually inspired by English people going over to spend vacations at Italian villas and things like that. Um, and so what it has is rounded, see the rounded windows and doors, those are references to Roman arches, see. Uh, and then this is a round window is another reference like that. And inside the school, if you've been in there, there are two perfectly round Roman arches leading to the two sides for the boys and girls to go into the, into the desks. And so the, the Roman mo motif goes throughout. So this Italian eight was a later style. And if you look at it in houses, usually it has a double door uh, instead of a single door. But, so it's, it's still a folk version here, uh, but it, you can tell what things are once you get to know sort of what the characteristics are. And then here we are in the church, and the church is actually Romanesque, is what it's called, because it has Roman arches here and here, uh, and also here. And there's also a round window here, which is really kind of Italian eight, but it's uh, 1837, so Romanesque is really the right word for a church when you come to this kind of Roman style. Um, and then the, the parsonage uh, right next to it is Gothic, which we'll get to here. Um, see how much steeper the roof is here. And the, the gables, there's cross gables here. It's act, this is actually Gothic because it's, it follows the narrow arches of the Gothic cathedral. That's the reference for the narrow uh, angle of the roof. And then also commonly, uh, Greek revivals, a lot of them have these corner porches, uh, which include these sort of spindle railings. That's, that's all kind of uh, normal for, for a Gothic revival. Uh, and the other thing is that Gothic revivals are generally cruciform. Uh, Gothic was in churches symbolized, you know, a holy place and so forth. And so this was about symbolizing the sanctity of the home, actually. And this was a whole social movement that developed starting in the 1820s. Oh, I wanted to show you this, though. This is high style Gothic. <laughs> Just to show you how fancy it can get. Uh, this we call gingerbread. Um, these are, uh, that's the colloquial term for it, but it's all this uh, fancy woodwork and coins on the corner here. These are called coins, which is Q-U-O-I-N-S, which is a funny spelling. It's like Latin. It's made to look like, uh, it's made to look like stone, but it's actually wood. It's all wood. Um, yeah, so the, the really high style ones, which were made for the, the really wealthy folks on the Hudson and so forth, are stone. Um, you know, but this is a high style one in wood, and so it's really, uh, this is more like a middle class kind of thing, upper middle, I would guess, or lower upper, somewhere in that uh, neighborhood. And the other thing you get, see, is these Gothic arches here on the, uh, this part here, uh, Gothic arches over windows here, and also this trefoil here is very common. There's one right here above the window, too. It's part of the Gothic style to have the Gothic arch and the trefoil in the arch. Uh, it's very common. So you get Gothic windows with trefoils. If you go to Meadowbrook Hall, you'll see the, the stained glass windows have trefoils in the top and their Gothic arches over them. Um, and that was, uh, you know, Tudor style also. So, but this is your, your high style Gothic, uh, lots of fun. Um, it's hard to upkeep this sort of thing. Um, this was the Beecher sisters uh, gothic cruciform household design and these were uh, some of the first women to actually design a house uh, in uh, the United States. 
Uh, they designed, it was Catherine Beecher and her famous sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? Everybody knows that one, right? But Catherine Beecher founded one of the early schools for girls that was comparable education-wise to boys' schools. Um, in the 1700s, women started founding schools for girls. There, you know, girls didn't go to school, generally, other than the very first schools um, that were held at home, uh, which, uh, which were called mother schools and so forth. Those the, Women often didn't get even grammar school education in the 1700s, until about 1790, then they started being included in, in public schools in towns in the United States. Um, but uh, the Beecher, she founded one of the first schools in 1820 in Hartford, Connecticut, that was actually comparable to a boys' school. Um, some boys' schools did start preparatory school, you know, upper, ac they called them acad academies, actually, in contrast to public schools. Started admitting girls in the 1780s, actually, 1770s and 80s. After, after the Revolutionary War, um, there was a whole actual amount of unrest among the women that they weren't getting the vote, along with the men. Uh, you know, uh, remember um, what uh, John, John Adams and uh, his wife Abigail, um, who his, Abigail sent him a letter saying um, something to the effect of, would you include women in the vote kind of thing, and he didn't. Um, so, yeah, so, so part, of, part of the argument that happened after the uh, revolution, which is really interesting, was to, to compensate women for not getting the vote, and actually, very fascinating, they lost the vote in New Jersey, where they had it when it was a colony. So they actually lost something there. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, there was a whole um, ideology that developed after the Revolutionary War, and the argument was uh, that women's moral influence had a higher moral influence uh, and were teaching the future leaders of America as, their, as the pr people who were bringing up the children, uh, that they were inculcating citizen virtues in, in the leaders, the male leaders of, of the future, that kind of idea. Uh, and this was called the cult of Republican motherhood. They had a name for it even. Uh, Either that or the, uh, or the historians gave it that name, I can't remember. But anyway, um, Catherine, Catherine and her sister, the Beecher sisters, uh, wrote some domestic manuals. And in these manuals, actually, this one in 1869 that they wrote together. Um, first, Catherine Beecher wrote one in 1841, and she advocated it, some other house designs. Um, but this one they wrote together, and they actually urged that housework be considered a profession equal to men's professions and that it be remunerated. So this, in 1869, was the first pay for housework movement. Most of us think it didn't start until 1970 or so. You know, this is a century earlier. They're already you know, talking about it. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And this, this is, shows you the Gothic house symbolism. The symbolism was that uh, since women were to be considered more moral than men, now why would they be considered more moral than men, right? I mean, when you start out in the Puritan time period in the 1600s, men are considered more moral than women um, because of the original sin of Eve, right? Yeah, that's why. Uh, and this got turned around starting in the late 1600s because men got pulled out of the churches into capitalism. And capitalist values were in conflict with church values. And so the men left the church in droves and you were left with three women to one man in the church congregations. And the ministers decided maybe the women were more holy than the men. <laughs> and, and the women were the women were upholding church values. See, the thing about capitalism that's a problem for the church is 
It allows usury. Remember in the Bible it says, neither a borrower nor a lender be, right? Lending money was against the biblical rules, and yet it's intrinsic to capitalism, right? It's fundamental to capitalism. And so money lending, price gouging, uh, not paying people a fair wage, that's exploitation of people. In the Bible it says uh, something about not taking advantage of people's, necess uh, people's um, necessity. Uh, and so in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, when it was a Puritan theocracy, and it was ruled by the, by the Puritans, it was actually illegal to lend money, take advantage of people, you couldn't even raise the price on goods if you lost a whole ship of them at sea. No, no, no. You know, so, but this broke down in the 18th century as capitalism came to dominate uh, exchange over, you know, you were still a majority of people were farmers, but merchants came to dominate over the farmers in the country and, uh, business, and small businesses and so forth. And so uh, men left the church to a large extent. Women were actually reconverting their husbands and sons back to the church at this time in the mid, you know, 1700s, late 1700s, and so forth. Uh, so women became identified with church values. Not men, but women, because women upheld the communitarian values of sharing, being fair, love, et cetera, which were all antithetical to capitalism. Right? Um, so this was the source of the shift from considering men more moral to considering women more moral. And to this day, this is still hanging on. There's still this kind of residual feeling when women run for office for politicians that they're going to be more moral somehow. Um, now I don't know if it's true anymore, but there you have it. So in the, in the homes then, what they did was to symbolize the sanctity of women in the home, the, their higher morality, by the fact that they were removed from men's sinful capitalist sphere in their domestic sphere, which was depicted as close to nature. Remember the whole thing about women being closer to nature? That was, at this time, made them superior because they weren't being corrupted by money. And they talked about corruption by money uh, at this time. And um, they symbolized the higher sanctity of the home with crosses on the, these steep gables and using the Gothic style of the house. Uh, so in the inside, they also had Gothic arches. In the, in the entryways, in the stairway here. They had recesses of statues of Madonna and child uh, and so forth. And this little round table with the flowers on it was used for uh, what was called the cult of home religion, which was actually promoted uh, by reverends, uh, Horace Bushnell, among others. He was a very famous reverend at the time. Um, saying that, well, uh, if you're out on the farm and you're too far to get to church, or even if you go to church, uh, women conducted uh, Bible readings for the family. Um, so they were considered like the ministers of the family flock in analogy to the ministers of the church, in the formal church. Um, and so there's a lot of symbolism here with the Gothic, also the Gothic furniture and so forth that you can see. And the other thing is that the house is cruciform in shape. Although it's a rather strange looking cross, it is, and that was deliberate, is what I'm trying to tell you. That even though it doesn't look like a good cross to us, cruciform was uh, meant to symbolize the higher morality of women and their domestic sphere, along with all the other symbols that we talked about. And they put the kitchen on one side and the entry on the other side here. And actually, the interesting thing is that our parsonage here also is fundamentally cruciform in shape, uh, although it's, not, it's a little bit dog-legged. It's not exactly cruciform, but it's really close. 
And it actually has wider wings than that uh, one that was designed by the Beecher sisters. So it's more of a true cruciform shape, in fact. Um, so it all fits with regard to these ideals. Uh, and they also, at this time, worked on you know, improving the insides, but we'll not talk about that. So now the excavation part of the parsonage which uh, started in 2004, 2003 actually. We did 2003 to 2005, and Professor Stamps and I um, directed this, organized a bunch of students uh, from the Anthropology Club at the University of, um, and also from my historical archaeology class uh, at the university. Uh, and so these were, this is just one year's worth, but it's sort of uh, typical of uh, who we had. Uh, and then this was just to show you that you can see how far, this is where the church is in the distance, and here's the foundation for the parsonage. So what you realize is they are much further apart than where they could be reconstructed here. Um, and there, there was just a lot more space back then um, <clears throat> in general, uh, fewer people around the space. So this is actually where we did the excavations. This is the foundation of the parsonage. And these were just test pits, so they're not very big. They're only um, you know, about the size of a shovel wide and maybe two shovels long or something like that. Uh, and you'll see we also, they, the only big excavation was done actually in the foundation in the basement here. Um, and then these back here, these squares back here were to try to find a barn that we knew was back there from the documentary record. Um, and over here we had heard there was a dump or we were looking for maybe a privy or something, but we didn't find a privy, but, and we didn't really find a dump either. Um, here's the foundation looking from the back. This is so as if we were standing right around here uh, looking towards the road out here. Uh, there's the foundation. And then this is though, see this tree here? This tree is like the reference point for the site. So the pictures I do are always gonna have that tree in it, practically. <laughs> so you can tell where you are, okay? So you're now looking forward that if we rotate around to the right, here's this tree here, we're moving to look in the back. Um, and you can see part of the foundation here. Uh, there was a test pit being, uh, we screened all the, all the dirt to recover the little pieces of things that we found. Uh, and then um, this cistern was visible above the foundation here. And uh, one weekend, when I couldn't make it, I think, Professor Stamps uh, excavated this with a bunch of students, and it was kind of interesting to see the repair that was done on the top of this later than the earlier material. Um, then most of the excavation was done in the backyard, so here's this big tree again looking back. Um, there's the tree again. And so we're excavating, actually next to this tree there was a walkway that went right out of the back door of the house, you know, in the back. And so there was some excavation along, the, we did some excavation along that, um, and here was uh, a family of one of my students, actually, Jasmine Ott and her whole family came and <laughs> helped in some excavation. So there were, besides the students, there were some community people that came as well. Um, and this was looking at what they found and little bits of pieces of things. Uh, and then we also did some excavation. This is further back looking for a dump, which we didn't really find. There was some... Uh, some bulldozed dirt, some dirt had already been bulldozed around and we did find some stuff in some of that, some, some little ceramic bits. And then uh, this area back in here was where we thought the, the uh, barn might be. There was this walkway going across the back that might have gone to the barn and so we looked a little bit in there. And then Professor Stamps found these, uh, this could have been foundation stones for the barn, we're not sure. Maybe, maybe not, but anyway, it was uh, interesting. Of course, when you get to a barn, you don't really find much there except the foundation. We were interested in where it was located, but generally, uh, you're talking about animals, and you don't find too many ceramics and stuff back there, usually. 
Uh, although we did find some interesting things. Somebody had been doing some skeet shooting in the backyard, and we found the broken clay pigeons and things like that. So, <laughs> so there were some little bits back in the back here in the barn excavations. There were some little bits of ceramic and glass here, but not, a, not, not much. Uh, and the, the main big excavation we did was in the cellar hole here of the, base, of the basement, uh, which um, had had a, at some point, had an oil furnace put in it. We ran into parts of that, or the students did, I should say. Um, and then there was this door on the bottom, which is, was one of those you know, cellar doors that you have on the outside of a cellar. What are those things called? I keep forgetting. Storm cellars. Yeah, storm cellar doors. You know, on that. So there was one of those down on the bottom here. Uh, and then, as I remember, underneath that, uh, we f there they found a beer bottle here. Um, and so th these are um, Methodists. You know, this is a Methodist church. It's a Methodist. Yeah. Okay, those people that know about Methodists, my grandparents were Methodists. They were teetotalers. So Methodists, generally, they are enjoined not to smoke and drink and do all those bad things, which is actually very good. But um, for your health and all that. But uh, uh, so, so the question arose, you know, how did that beer bottle get there? Uh, who put it there? And it, it was right in the very, I thought, suspiciously in the corner of the, um, of the cellar. Um, and uh, there, there actually came out a, a piece in the uh, Detroit Free Press um, uh, where the, per the previous part, the last person who lived in here in the 1970s said, oh no, it couldn't possibly be the parson, right? Uh, <laughs> um, there was, a, at, 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 uh, in the 70s, this building actually had an antique store in it. And so they said, of course, it was from the antique store. But the parson's wife also mentioned in this, uh, in this story that, that the basement flooded a lot. And I'm, so I'm like, well, would you put valuable antiques in a basement that floods? I don't know. You know it doesn't sound logical to me. Um, so we, we don't know who exactly. My favorite hypothesis on this is that the kids did it. You know. <laughs> that they were sneaking drinks you know, um, illicitly, which is certainly completely possible. However, I gave this talk at the Conference for Michigan Archaeology um, last year. And in the audience, one of my colleagues, an archaeologist, whose father was a psychologist, said that every Sunday, his father took a big briefcase full of beer over to the Parsons' house to counsel him about how to counsel his parishioners. But because, the, because the, the parson couldn't overtly go out and buy beer, or wine for that matter, or booze, the, the psychologist would bring it to him in a big satchel every, every week. Yeah. So, so I know, I know that some of the parsons were drinking. Um, and, I, and I should say also that, uh, well, I think Methodists, the idea was that um, people would not drink in their homes. When you got to, say, prohibition, which was a big movement in this country, starting in some, some, some uh, states, actually, like Vermont and Maine, started in 1850 with prohibition. They were really ahead of the game. This is because the farmers were making so much cider, they were having too many accidents with their machinery. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was a serious problem. People were drinking way, way too much cider on the farms. Um, so that was, the, that was how it started. Uh, and there was a whole big movement for prohibition. But what's interesting about that is that it was OK to drink in your home with prohibition, apparently, to a large extent. Um, so anyway, that, that was an interesting uh, point. And now it's a park uh, where the site is located. Uh, and you can still kind of see where the driveway was back here and so forth. Um, and my student, uh, Jasmine Otten, who did uh, for her some of her projects in historical archaeology and also an independent study with me, analyzed the artifacts, which means that she carefully uh, cataloged them 
on the computer in an Excel spreadsheet, so you describe each artifact uh, and where it was found, how deep it's found in the ground and so forth, which can, can mean as you excavate deeper in the ground, it can be older um, if things aren't disturbed, if they haven't been dug up. Uh, then you can, then things are older as they go deeper, which is an improvement. So this is, is important information. So these were some excavation pictures like the ones I just showed you, and then some of the findings, which some of the modern stuff, Coca-Cola bottles, but some other bottles. There were, now our whole question, research question on doing this excavation was to what, what can we tell about the life ways, you know, how people were living in the parsonage? How religious were they? Well, maybe the beer bottle was a clue. <laughs> you know, uh, but they were the parson, they should, the parsonage family, they should have been. So we did find ink bottles, which, you know, so I immediately thought about writing sermons when I saw this. Uh, and, you know, the one, the oldest one actually from 1850 over here was broken, but the other, these are like early 20th century um, kinds of things. Uh, then we did find a number of ceramics. And you can date ceramics by the style and the decoration, actually. So I know that these are all late 19th century just by looking at them, because this is my specialty. <laughs> so I can just look at them and say. So th this is, and I'll just show you some close-ups of some of these. These are transfer printed here. Um, this is also transfer printed, and transfer printed was made by taking a copper plate, engraving it with the design, putting a powdered coloring in it, what powdered minerals like cobalt is blue, lead is white, um, and so forth, um, antimony is yellow, uh, and then putting a piece of soapy paper brushing off the excess so it's only in the crevices, and then putting a piece of soapy paper on top of the copper plate, and it picks up the, the mineral powder, and you slap it onto the ceramic. That's why it's called transfer. You're transferring from the plate to the ceramic for the design. And so this is a late 19th century kind of design. Late 19th century designs are more sparse than earlier ones. Um, and if you think about it, and one, uh, an archaeological colleague of mine has, um, they were saving money by putting in less, less decoration and less color over time. However, this one, gilt flow blue, um, is this is around the turn of the century, like late like 1890s, early 20th century. Uh, and it has cobalt is the dark blue, and cobalt got more expensive over time. And so generally, blue decoration got lighter blue over time. But this is dark, which means it was more expensive. And it's also gilt, which means it was more expensive. That's real, so you know, this is real little bits of gold put over the top. And then uh, these are transfer print, just regular down here at the bottom. Now this was the only real piece of, um, the only real piece that had any kind of religious iconography on it that we found. Only artifact that had any, anything religious on it. Um, so if you look at it, you can see, if you look close, this is a church spire here. And it's a German church spire, furthermore, because it's got these little ears off the side. Uh, and then there's factories in the front here, and this is a, sh a ship's sail here. So this is a harbor scene. Uh, with a ship coming into harbor here and factories in the foreground and a church in the background. That's as much uh, religious we got now. Interestingly enough, in the church here, they found a, t a temperance poster in the attic. So it sounded like they were kind of uh, uh, serious about um, not drinking because um, they did have that poster. We also found this pot lid here, which was broken about three times and mended about three times. The documents showed that this was not a wealthy church, and parishioners were asked to bring uh, wood for the fire, wood for the stove to heat during the sermons and so forth, and to help clean out the church afterwards and so forth. So it was, it was not a wealthy church, and this showed that. Um, and in fact, in the reconstruction, there is a cast iron pot with a lid that's exactly like this. There's also a um, hat 
mold that was found in the wall of this building, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't ask me why, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's just weird, right? So, and then there's what, there was a horse brush here and some other, lots of nails um, and lots of other bits and pieces. What I've shown you are sort of the more interesting uh, bits. But the thing that's really important here is that um, if we had found beer bottles or parts of beer bottles uh, if they'd been, say, dug up by somebody who wanted to just sell them or something, we never would have found out that they were drinking in the parsonage. <laughs> so, so this is a prime example of showing you the importance of not, not digging up stuff in your backyard, if, if your backyard is old, uh, or in privies and stuff like that, is that, that in fact, uh, if you do, what you do when you do that is you're taking the artifact, whether it's a bo beer bottle or whatever it is, out of its historical context where it can give you some information, in this case some important information about who was drinking where and when. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but if you take it out of context, uh, then if you take it out of the site, then you lose that information. Uh, you never know that people were drinking at the parsonage or what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, or in the case of the ink bottles that they were writing sermons and so forth. Uh, which I happen to think is, is pretty interesting uh, because there is this whole question of you know, how serious, and the fact that it was the Parsons house puts a whole other new level on it. I mean, we knew that some of the members of the church might not have been too serious about uh, not drinking, although my grandparents were very serious about it. Um, but um, not everybody was, and, and the, uh, the possibility that the parson or his kids might not be is a whole new level of um, non-seriousness around this. Uh, so this was the opening of the parsonage, and just to show that there was this wonderful gathering here. And uh, also, just to show you that uh, this parsonage is not alone, uh, there have been excavations at a number of other Methodist sites where they have found alcohol bottles. <laughs> so just to show you that my, my archaeological colleague uh, is not the only one who had a father who delivered beer, beer bottles. This is actually the, the oldest Methodist church in New York City. And uh, my colleague, Serene Bauer at Cornell, uh, excavated this along with uh, some other people. And they found booze bottles in the church. That's even worse than the parsonage, I presume. <laughs> you know, so what, what it turned out was uh, that they found out that this church was, originally it was about this big, and then 1758, and then it was rebuilt in 1840, like that. Uh, and the interior was, looked, like, it looked like this until recently, fairly recently. Um, what it turned out was uh, that this church, uh, some of the wealthy members in this church wanted to move out of the not so good neighborhood and move uptown to where it was ritzier. And the poorer members of the church wanted it to stay right where it was. And they did a sit-in in the church overnight and they got arrested by the cops and they drank overnight in the church. And that's what, <laughs> and that's what my colleague Shereen Bauer excavated. They excavated the booze bottles from this protest, along with some food remains as well, as you might expect. Um, they also found alcohol bottles in this old First Baptist church in Middletown, New Jersey. Uh, and, <laughs> This, uh, these are excavation, this is the, the reason you do archaeological excavations, to make sh sure that when you excavate a booze bottle, that it, you know what it's associated with. If it's associated with Methodists or Baptists, it makes a whole lot of difference, you know, as contrasted to if you just go out and sell it and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so in the Hamline University, which was a Methodist university, uh, they also found booze bottles. And the thing that's interesting here is that not all the students were Methodists. And so, although booze bottles were not legal on campus, they excavated them. <laughs> but I should also mention that the excavations at Harvard found, you know, pipes and extra stuff that were not allowed to. So students, as we all know, 
uh, do things that aren't allowed. Uh, and so that's what, that's what really happened here. Uh, so also in uh, Skagway, there was a priest. This is interesting because it's a Catholic priest who was leading the prohibition movement in Skagway. And guess what was in his privy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then they excavated, there was wine bottles, actually. Now you could argue maybe it was for communion, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe, okay. But it turns out, this is where I was saying, when they actually wrote about prohibition, what they were really doing in prohibition around 1916 is when this priest was, they had his, his name was Father Turnell, and interestingly enough, he was Italian. He was of the Italian nobility, furthermore. And he went all the way to Alaska, but he took his fancy Italian china with him. So we exca they excavated, this was Kathy Spoody, who's another colleague of mine, out of the privy, there were these amazing gilt porcelain, this whole, you know, porcelain vessels that he brought with him from Italy. Um, and he had his wine, he wasn't going to, he's Italian nobility, he's not giving up his wine. <laughs> you know, think of it, you know. So, <laughs> So, uh, but he was leading the local prohibition in 1916, and this is what led me to read about prohibition a little bit and find out that they actually said, well, what they were really doing with prohibition was arresting the Native Americans and the Irish who were getting drunk in the saloons and wandering around drunk in the public streets. Those, that was what prohibition was used to arrest people for. But if you drank wine at home during dinner, eh, you know, not a big problem. So it was public drunkenness that prohibition was really about. And that's, I thought, was kind of interesting. Um, so that's the end for, um, for that, yeah? They actually had displays of some of that stuff up there in Alaska. Yeah, in, in Skagway, yeah. What they found, sure, oh, that's interesting. You went up and saw it, yeah. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's uh, Skagway's kind of a famous uh, cruise destination, actually. Uh, <laughs> my my parents cruised up there, so I found out about it. Um, so, um, if there are uh, any questions about this to start with, um, yeah. How old was the beer bottle you found? Did they only find one? It was 1884. Roughly speaking, like that, and they, we just they had a cold bed down there. Uh, the the, yeah. See, yeah, you know, there are those arguments about it. There was, and, and I thought about. Dusty stuff, you know. Well, right, right, and I also, I also thought about, you know, because they had a, a, a had an oil furnace installed at some point, so that's also a possibility. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did think of that. Um, because, uh, but it was clearly not done by the workmen who built the parsonage, because that's earlier, like in the, in the 1870s sometime. So that's, that's, that, was, that was one possibility that didn't work out. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't really know exactly how they got there, but, um, but I do have lots of other examples of uh, Methodist drinking, and so <laughs> I think we can't rule out the kids anyway. I don't know about the parson, but the kids, you know, <laughs> I think are definitely a possibility. And the workmen are also, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, it's possible. Although, you know, if the, I, I was thinking, well, if the kids had to sneak to drink in the basement, would the workmen be allowed to drink in the basement? Well, you know, I don't know, get into all these kind of arguments about it, and I'm not sure uh, what's possible. Uh, on that, but I think I thought this was very interesting, and it shows you that we had to find the beer bottle uh, actually in the basement to know that it was connected with the parsonage somehow. Um, if we had found it out around uh, in the yard somewhere, it could have been connected with the church or something like that. You know, so um, so it's finding it where we did was very important, and that's why archaeologists excavate very carefully and. I, and record where things are found so you can figure out what the meaning is exactly. Um, and now I'm going to show, um, I have a video actually about the excavations. Well, it actually was after the excavations at Fort Independence in Boston. And so um, we can show a short video about that. And then I'm also going to, I can tell you a little bit more about that too. Yeah, they need to do that. Um, and this excavation was um, 
done by a number of people. Um, some people from Harvard mostly did excavations at Fort Independence. Uh, and they found privies there that were just filled with stuff. But the interesting thing was, one was the officer's privy, and one was the non-commissioned officers or enlisted men's privy. And those two privies, it was important that it was recorded which privy things came from, because we learned about the lifeways of those different groups from those privies. Yeah, oh, so yeah, push play. Yeah, right, OK. Yeah, I might have to turn it up. Fort Independence, located on Castle Island, has played a major role in both the military and leisure history of the city of Boston. The fort presently being renovated, dating from 1834 to 1851, is the last of eight forts on Castle Island. Although the existing Fort Independence was completed just a decade before the Civil War, there were fortifications on Castle Island as early as 1634. Early earth and timber fortifications were replaced by the first stone fort in 1673, just before King Philip's War. Castle William, constructed by the British in 1701 to 1703, protected royal officials from the turmoil caused by the Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre, and the Boston Tea Party. In 1754, the first marine hospital was established at Castle William followed by a vaccination and quarantine center for smallpox in 1764. <coughs> the British leveled Castle Wood and disabled the guns as they evacuated Boston in March of 1776. Evacuation Day now celebrates this event. Then the Patriots, including Paul Revere and Richard Ridley, engineer of Bunker Hill, constructed an earthwork that was too large to easily defend. In 1798, Massachusetts ceded Castle Island to the federal government. The next year, the fort was renamed Fort Independence during a visit by President John Adams, and a new fortification was subsequently built. The first five bastion brick fort was built by Colonel John Fonsen in 1801 and defended Boston Harbor in the War of 1812. The present granite fort was proposed by Colonel Sylvanus Thayer in 1834 and completed in 1851, after which it saw service in the Civil War. Fort Independence was deactivated as an artillery post in 1879, but was reactivated during the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II as a support facility. Fort Independence was originally on an island, but as early as 1883, Frederick Law Olmsted proposed incorporating Castle Island as part of the emerald necklace of parks around Boston, including this new marine park. In 1891, Castle Island was leased to the Boston Metropolitan Park System. Plans were implemented to transform it into a park. A wooden pier connected the island with the mainland, while concession stands were constructed to cater to a public interested in enjoying sea airs. Marine Park was an anchorage for yachts in the 1920s. Subsequent plans to upgrade the island were proposed with an earthen causeway connecting the island to the mainland. The island's extent can still be identified from the remaining seawall capstones. In the 1960s, the Department of Defense declared Castle Island a surplus property and sold it to the MDC. In 1964, the Commission upgraded the island's causeway, initiating the first phase of renovations in the 1970s. Captain Swanson is the MDC archivist who has been involved in the renovation of the fort since the 1960s. The MDC's plans to restore Fort Independence were stimulated by archaeologists from the beginning. In 1973, when we were tying trees in the fort, I invited Dina Dinkos, the archaeologist, to survey the area. She suggested, because of the artifacts found in the tree holes, that we do a scientific archaeological investigation if we were going to restore the fort for the 1976 bicentennial celebration. Recognizing the unavoidable damage a restoration would cause, the MDC took a landmark stand for the Commonwealth by including an archaeological uh, program in the restoration contract. Preliminary excavations were conducted in 1974 by William Turnbaugh, then at Harvard. Turnbaugh worked with the architect, restoring the fort to generally assess the fort's archaeological potential. 
He found two cellar holes from the early 1800s fort. He also tested within the casements and on top of the ramparts. These excavations revealed that the remains of earlier forts were preserved below the ground and would require further attention by professional archaeologists during renovations. The MDC's planned renovations required putting utilities underground that would disturb the remains of earlier forts lying beneath the parade ground. Therefore, the Commission authorized archaeological excavations to prevent the destruction of remains of earlier forts when utility trenches were dug into the parade ground. Phase 1 excavations started at the same time as the construction work in February 1976 and continuing through April 1977. The Commission contracted Brown University's Public Archaeology Lab to conduct the excavations within the area to be altered by the renovation project. These excavations included sections of the fort's ramparts, the parade ground, and casements, as well as utility trenches inside and outside the fort. While the narrow trench could not be excavated with ideal archaeological squares or methods, the excavations were monitored for artifacts and structural foundations. These excavations yielded information about life in the early forts that were replaced by the present fort during the 1840s. From the 1703 British Castle William, structural remains encountered in the excavations included a 1701 powder magazine and a 1701 battery wall. Remnants of a 1770s Revolutionary War period barracks were also uncovered by archaeological excavations. From the 1801 Fontsena Fort, a barrack cellar hole as well as a number of privies or outhouses were revealed by excavations. This stone line privy was excavated behind the officer's quarters, while another wood line privy was excavated near the Sally Port guardhouse. On the island, structural remains associated with the present 1840s fort included the commandant's quarters and several of its outbuildings. While within the fort, excavations uncovered remnants of now demolished living quarters and barracks, as well as a number of cisterns, drains, and wells. Most of the artifacts recovered were from features located beneath the present 1851 parade ground, but associated with the 1801 fort. This is not surprising, since the utility lines required by the renovations effectively ran behind the site of the old 1801 period quarters, and occupied the same space as the outbuildings behind the quarters. The privies were important, because they provided a substantial amount of information about the undocumented or poorly recorded aspects of military life at the fort. The privies, as well as other features, were carefully excavated in layers so that associations between artifacts were recovered in their relative depth in the soil. In general, the sequence of layers and artifacts in them get older as the excavation goes deeper. Dr. Suzanne Spencer Wood transported the artifacts for further analysis by her students in historical archaeology. The anthropology department at the University of Massachusetts at Boston is located just across the bay from Fort Independence. Dr. Spencer Wood also set up an exhibit of artifacts from the fort in order to make them accessible to interested public groups, such as the Castle Island Association. At a fort, one would expect to find a lot of military artifacts. In fact, at Fort Independence, relatively few military artifacts, such as this cannonball, were found, probably because the fort saw little military action. Most of the artifacts found at the fort tell us about the everyday lives of military men and their families who lived at the fort. A number of artifacts tell us about the diet and health of people at the fort. Seeds such as these and bones tell us about the foods they ate. Bottles such as this, patent medicines, this one says Dalby's carminative, tell us about health problems at the fort. Redware bowls were used for food preparation and stoneware jars for food storage. We learn about social life from liquor bottles and pipes. A number of different kinds of ceramic tableware were found at the fort. Chinese export porcelain, hand-painted, imported from China, is the most expensive, 
and was probably used by officers and their families for table service. Transfer printed ceramics, such as these, were a little less expensive, were probably used by junior officers at the fort. Undecorated creamware, the cheapest, was probably used by enlisted men. Other artifacts tell us about family life at the fort, such as women's and children's shoes and children's toys, including this child's mug. Ceramics were found in privies at the fort. Parts of Fort Independence have undergone reconstruction, so visitors can experience historic aspects of the fort. This section of the fort was restored to show the relationship between the uh, casemate room with the cannon facing the outside of the fort and the officers' quarters facing the parade ground. The granite in the casemate room was given a fine finish where it, was where it could be seen, and the granite in the uh, officers' quarters was left rough where it would be behind the plaster. Since the summer of 1985, Further renovations have been undertaken to prepare Fort Independence as a historic site for public visitation. These renovations were planned by John Mayhew and engineered by Dick McKay. The archaeological and architectural renovations are under the direction of Bill Stokinger, an MDC archaeologist. We're, we're dealing with the question of stewardship. We're next time. Masonry repair has been required around one door of front five where a fire had cracked and spalled the original pink granite. The original granite came from the Quincy and Rockport, Massachusetts quarries. Granite from the same Rockport formation has been used in restoring the facade to its original appearance. Similarly, the challenge inside the fort is to reconstruct its original appearance using the remaining woodwork and plaster and repairing it with modern wood and plaster that blends into and strengthens the remains of original surfaces. Craftsmen take great pride in their restoration with hand tools, the window casings, and vents. Well, the windows here are very involved. We basically uh, have a lot of windows where there's virtually nothing left of them, somewhere that the frames were all rotted, and we've had to piece together from the few examples we have just what we want to do. Uh, they're very involved because there are panels that cover the thickness of the granite, which is about two feet or so. And these panels are all tongued and grooved into each other and into the window frame itself. New bricks had to be matched to replace those missing brick walls due to fire damage and to reconstruct the oven in the bakery. The fort had early 19th century asphalt floors to prevent sparks from setting off ammunition. The brick structures of the powder storage magazines were lined with copper nailed wood sheathing to prevent sparks from igniting the black powder. Parts of the wood lining remained at one of the powder magazines, while the other had been burned, leaving marks where the wood lining had been attached. The wood lining of one magazine is carefully restored, and the other will be left to show the brick structure behind the wood. These renovations require only limited excavation in order to install utilities. The excavations were monitored, and the few artifacts encountered were salvaged. Even with a salvage archaeology, Further information was gained about the fort's landscape, thereby enhancing our knowledge of how fort independence looked in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I can uh, also tell you a little bit about uh, a student of mine, Joyce Clements, who did some gender analysis of this fort. They usually think about forts as, you know, men's sites where men live, but actually whole families live there, particularly officers' wives, but also even non-commissioned officers' wives. And so the Fonson Fort, which is what you've been looking at uh, and was excavated, the thing that's, that they were able to analyze was because they excavated the officer's privy that you saw that was stone-lined privy, and then the non-commissioned officer's privy, which was wood-lined, right? So you can see the status differences already just in the construction of the privies. Um, 
And so I, I looked at some pictures of the time period. I don't really have a lot more pictures of the artifacts from Fort Independence itself, but this gives you some idea of the kinds of things they found in the married officers' privy were, believe it or not, gilt epaulets, swords, sash, satin sashes, um, and uh, it just sort of, I was wondering if they got in a fight and somebody won and threw out the other guy's stuff or what happened? You know, <laughs> I was really like, how did it get in there? You know, this is really, this is really uh, major stuff here. Um, the men also, uh, because they were, they had a, a men's mess, mess hall that was tended by men, they were waiters, domestic servants, um, bakers and cooks. Uh, that you would think would be women's roles, but they weren't in the fort because the men were in charge of the mess hall. Um, and they, then they also were tailors and gardeners and schoolmasters as well for the children that were at the site. And the women were laundresses and seamstresses um, as well as wives. And of course, we know the stories about Molly Pitcher. There are actually a couple women who might have been Molly Pitcher in the uh, Revolutionary War. Um, they were, women were, however, usually had these roles, were also nurses. Um, they served food to some of the soldiers before the Battle of Yorktown. I thought the interesting thing was that even in working women had corsets, um, which you would think would be a problem when you're doing a lot of work, um, but uh, they did. And here are some of the high fashions that were changing from the 18th century here over to starting in 1793 in the early 19th century. So Fonson's Fort would have had these kinds of um, early 19th century. These were inspired by uh, Napoleon's wife, who uh, was going for the Greek as a way of legitimating the Napoleon's rule. Um, and so that's where this style started. And notice the shawls. So they found some of these silk, uh, a silk shawl like this in uh, the officer's privy. Uh, and they also found like a satin shoe and a whole satin shoe. What this tells you is that the officer's wives were maintaining the high status of their husbands by keeping up with fashion. And they would throw out a whole shoe if it was out of style. You know, otherwise, because if you look at the men's shoes in the privy, they're repaired. The women's shoes are not. The, the children's shoes are repaired as well. So you can tell something about what's going on. The women are very important. The officers' wives are extremely important in displaying the status of the officers to other officers, the non-commissioned officers, other officers at the fort, visitors, etc. And so you get this change over time from the 1790s empire style, we still call it an empire style, and it was after the French empire essentially, uh, and then, and the Greek empire before that, the toga, and then your later 1830s is what you would get at the uh, Fort Fonsin here. These are the later styles. Um, so they also found in the officer's privy uh, women's velvet ribbons, uh, satin belt and shoes, and so here's some representative kinds of uh, things. How they used ribbons is just incredible uh, here, I think. And crepe millinery, which is the hat. Um, and they also found a, a part of resist printed silk, which, and this is a dress I found online. These are not, none of this stuff is from the fort, but it gives you an idea what it would have looked like. Uh, and a brass locket. This is an early 19th century brass locket with um, liberty kinds of symbols on it. This is, you know, the torch like from the um, Statue of Liberty. Um, and perfume bottles. These tortoiseshell combs were incredible. They found some of these. Uh, that were part of the hairdos of this time period, literally made from tortoise shells. You know, this is today we call it tortoise shell glasses, but it's plastic. Then it was really tortoise shell. <laughs> and here's some of the less fancy ones, but you can see the color and so forth. Uh, and then they also found some silk stockings. Uh, I thought this was, I put this in here because uh, these were the stockings worn by Queen Victoria at her coronation, and the two stockings are different colors, which I thought was really interesting. Um, <laughs> so not, not, you know, some, we're not the, it still goes on, people grab slightly di discolored socks. Um, then cotton stockings, uh, wine bottles were found in the officer's privy. 
uh, the Chinese export porcelain, whole sets of dishes with uh, platters, condiment dishes, terrines. This is hand painted stuff. The different shapes and sizes of uh, bowls and twiffler is what we would call a bread plate uh, today. Um, so you can see they had whole settings of this stuff from like the early 19th century thrown in the, in the officer's privy. And then the transfer stuff as well. Here's what I was talking about, the early transfer print in the 1820s with the dark blue, which is a lot of cobalt. Uh, and then later on it gets lighter blue because the cobalt gets more expensive. Um, it's not a choice kind of thing. And they also found teacups, uh, there's your teapot, coffee, coffee cups, uh, and chocolate cups, all different shapes, you can see that. Uh, and these are just representative types of things. And then in the uh, non-commissioned officers privy, which these are the uniforms for infantry officers, they found instead uh, hand-painted pearlware. And what I want you to notice is this looks a lot like the Chinese export porcelain that's hand-painted, but it's not. It's cheaper. It's the, it's the working man's imitation of Chinese export porcelain. And it's made in England. So it you know, has a lot less transport involved, so it's a lot less expensive. And then creamware, which is also made in England, but was named Queensware after Queen Charlotte, who bought uh, some of, a set of it. This was Wedgwood's uh, famous creamware that he was the first one to do celebrity marketing. He sold some of this to the Empress of Russia as well. And so everybody wanted to have some in England because the Queen had some. You know. Uh, the shell-edged uh, pearlware was also uh, not expensive. The creamware started out expensive in the 1700s with Queen Charlotte, who was uh, uh, King George's wife, but um, it became cheap by the 1790s or 1780s. Uh, and then pearlware also was, this edgeware is not, none of this is expensive stuff. So this is all the non-commissioned officers, but the non-commissioned officers had hard liquor and not wine. So. <laughs> Our theme here is booze, if you didn't notice. So, <laughs> so, so here we have um, a case bottle which holds gin. And gin is more of working class type of drink in England traditionally, uh, whereas wine is upper class. And so this goes with the difference in the privies as well. Uh, and there were also, like I said, repaired shoes. This, was, this is on board the USS Constitution, which is a ship dating from 1812 that has been kept alive in Boston in the Charleston Navy Yard ever since. And every year they take it out and, and sail, it around, or sail it around the harbor and shoot off a gun in the direction of Fort Independence. Uh, and uh, it's a big sort of celebration on the 4th of July. So I thought I'd end with that. Um, so if there's any questions about any of this, I did get done before nine, just barely. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Some of it was whole, as you saw with that that picture that was whole. Um, that some of it was, but most of it was broken, uh, but big pieces, uh, because it was thrown in whole. You know, the, it was a stack. You know, and interesting, at another site that was excavated by a colleague of mine, um, they also found, at a domestic site, they found uh, discards of stacks of dishes like this, and they looked at the dates of the dishes and the stratigraphy, and they found out that it correlated with every time the, the man married a new wife. The wife threw out the old ceramics and bought new ones. Yeah, and you could see it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the important, I mean, so we found out, you know, some of the behavior that you wouldn't otherwise know if you didn't excavate it in place. And, uh, and similarly, this was whole sets of dishes thrown out, and so probably they were getting the newer style uh, going on, because this was the early 19th century when the Chinese export porcelain went from being very expensive, upper class, to being more middle class. You know, ceramics always gets to be cheaper over time, and so they had to invent Wedgwood was always inventing a new style to, because he saw that stuff was getting cheaper over time. Uh, and so he was always doing this kind of thing. And uh, so that, that may have been what happened. There's another site that was excavated where they correlated throwing out a whole stack of dishes with um, 
a cholera epidemic and uh, people thinking that it was connected with the disease. Uh, and so people throwing out whole, you know, everything that they thought might be, have contagion on it, you know, kind of thing. And so there have been some interesting um, recoveries of this kind of thing, you know, stacks of whole sets of dishes like that for different reasons. I think, but it's, it's, you can find out if you correlate, you know, when you ex the, the depth of things that are excavated str stratigraphically and the age that you get in the documentary records and the date of the ceramics from the designs and stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Were most of the meals, the entrees cooked with cast iron or probably were there uh, metal or was it just wood? Yeah, right. Yep, yep. Cast iron is the standard thing um, when, that you excavate. I've excavated cast iron pots uh, at a general store in Vermont, and you know you've, we excavated some here. So that that was the, that was the standard thing. Of course, you still. I mean, I still use you know the cast iron frying pan, right? That thing is uh, they're indestructible, which is why archaeologists don't find many of them. <laughs> We don't, we don't, they get passed down, you know, you get your grandmothers, right? You know, it gets passed down. So, so we don't find, what, we only found this pot lid because it broke three times, cast iron pot. Three times, they mended it three times. And then it, you know, finally got thrown out. It's just too much. Maybe the third time did it, I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, it was just really uh, amazing because I, I, I have found cast iron pots, though, that have been broken through in the bottom, for instance, so that's why they got thrown out. You know, if they were thin, relatively thin. They used to have these pots that would have like an indent on the bottom to set it into the hole on the wood stove. You know, you'd have the, the lids on the wood stove, you'd take the lid out, set the pot, and the pot bottom would go right in that hole. And those pot lids bottoms got burnt off sometimes. So I've recovered those pots with the bottom burnt off, you know, you can see it's just gone down there. Uh, but those were thin, they weren't really, they weren't cast heavy, you know, they were thin. So, um, so you, can, you can tell a lot archeologically from, you know, being able to identify locating things with regard to in their associations with other things. You know, finding that beer bottle in relation to the, finding it underneath the cellar door showed us that it had been in the cellar, you know, um, and not, you know, from the surrounding dirt and stuff like that. So it's, it's important to, to look at how, th what, to recover things in relation to other things so you can figure out what their meaning is. You know, the, the um, ink jars used for writing sermons most likely, and if we'd found them somewhere else, we wouldn't have thought they were used for sermons, they would have been for something else. You know, so you can figure out when, where things are found. Um, anything else? Well, thank you very much.